Hello, this is Jackie B. Peterson. I'm your host today on Solo Pro Radio, where we're going to be talking all this year to solo uh, operators and encore entrepreneurs. You know, you have, those of you in one-person businesses who are looking for the financial success that you've always wanted. I'm the author of Better, Smarter, Richer, and we talk about the seven principles that you need to follow to make your solo business work for you the way that you want it to work for you. Please go to the website, bettersmarterricher.com, sign up for our free newsletter, download the free ebook, buy the book, and start doing the work. Better Smarter Richer is a fill-in-the-blanks workbook, and it makes you think about what it is that is holding you back from the financial success you're seeking. Also, join the conversation on the blog. It's a very active conversation going where we talk to and listen to uh, solos who are all over the country making their solo businesses work. So today, we are really blessed to have Gay Mitchell. Gay actually could be a poster child for Encore Entrepreneurship. She's going to tell us her story about how she was really burned out after 23 years as a teacher, and she turned to art. She got her master's degree in art therapy from Merrillhurst University, thinking that she would be able to get a job at a clinic working as an art therapist. But we know about jobs. There were no jobs. So Gay created her own work, really entrepreneurial Gay. She set up a studio in her home, and now she teaches art to kids, weaving art therapy into her lessons. She now works part-time and has the hours she wants, and she is able to paint and to travel. Sounds like a great success to me. We're going to be interested in hearing this story. Hello, Gay. Hello, Jackie. It's nice to meet you. Well, it's nice to meet you, too. And it sounds like I see you've got a terrific Encore Entrepreneur story for us. But uh, before you do that, why don't you tell us your background, like where you grew up, where you went to school, how, how, how you, you know, what you did as, as a teacher. Well, I grew up in the 50s, and I always wanted to be a teacher. And in the 50s, the only working women I knew or heard about were either teachers or nurses. So my parents asked me which one I wanted to be. Well, I was not comfortable around blood, and I did love school, so I just assumed that I would become a teacher. Growing up the oldest child in my Army family, we were constantly moving. So I went to seven different schools growing up. And teachers provided a sense of security and belonging each time I entered a new class. So I wanted to do that for other children. Uh, One time I was babysitting my two younger brothers when we were exploring in the Black Forest of Germany. I found an old shed and led them there. So I decided I could teach them all day in this shed. (laughs) Well, my brothers brothers were stuck. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and unfortunately, the door jammed, so I did teach them all day, but they didn't oh, like my. that lesson. <laughs> um, for, fortunately for us, the military police found us within a few hours, but I don't think my brothers remembered a single thing or liked anything I taught them that day. No, um, I'm sure they didn't. No. <laughs> But I didn't give up. When it was time for college, I majored in elementary education as a natural major and graduated with my teaching degree during the recession of 1975. So I also coincidentally became engaged, and um, my fiance, my husband and I moved to Pennsylvania, where once again the only job I could find was not teaching elementary school. So instead I taught preschool in the Appalachian Mountains while I was also the school bus driver. I got to do both. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Oh, my was, goodness. I, it, wow. It was quite, and an, an adventure. I only had seven students, so that made it doable. Um, I had just never driven a school bus before. But it all worked out, and my students were very poor, but they were very interesting. So I learned a lot that year. And after that, wow. we, we uh, decided to move back to Oregon, where my husband was born, and he then started law school in Eugene. Well, I didn't get a public school teaching job, but I did get a private kindergarten teaching job, which I did until he graduated. Then we moved to Portland. Then I began graduate school at Portland State in special education, thinking that there might be more jobs for teachers there. And by by golly, I was right. So after graduation, I got a job, and I taught boys in a residential treatment center at Waverly Children's Home here in Portland. Oh, my goodness. 
Wow. Yeah, I've, had, I've had quite a journey. The next you year, have. <laughs> and it's continuing. The next year, a job opened up in Portland, teaching in the public schools in a resource center for kids with learning disabilities. So that was a position I enjoyed, and I did it for about 10 years as I raised my family. And then the the rest of the story I've given you, I, I continued and eventually got burned out. And now I've discovered art, and I'm starting a new journey. Yeah, so so let's talk about that uh, a little bit. Um, so it wasn't that you were, like it must be middle school and high school where you are a you know, a geography teacher, a history teacher. So you were the classroom teacher in elementary school, so you were teaching all kinds of subjects. Is that right? Yeah, I did several different things. When I taught special ed, it was mostly reading and math, and I did that for mm-hmm. 13 years. Then uh-huh. I, tried, I did try regular um, grade teaching. I did first grade, second grade, and kindergarten for my last few years. Oh, my goodness. Well, and you took on, it sounds like, quite a few places where you had uh, difficult students and, um, you know, you were really intensely involved. And it sounds like you had a right to get tired and burned out to me. Yes, because the jobs were with the most difficult kids in those days. And it was not like this time. It was a recession when I started, much like it is today. Wow. So, Gay, then, you know, you retired from teaching and... And uh, talk about how you discovered art and painting. Had, had you done painting before? Had you been an artist? Were no, I've never artist? been an artist. No, but that's a very good <laughs> question. Um, I was so lucky when I was young. I had a grandfather who was a professional artist. And I only saw him, visited him probably five times because we lived as an army family very far from him. But during those five visits, he gave me art lessons on his front porch as he smoked a cigar and those were just (laughs) such memorable um, times for me and he gave me this love of art and after I left I think I started maybe at age four he said I want you to mail me a picture that you've made every week and I will give you feedback and he did every week oh my goodness I oh my goodness this picture and he would you know critique the color, always very positively. That went on for years. So I had private art lessons by mail. <laughs> but then, and he was know, an artist. And he was a professional artist, yes. Oh, um, my goodness. In Missouri. And then he, he passed away shortly after that. And then I had this long, dry period where I was teaching and I didn't do art. But luckily, I, had, I met a neighbor who was a professional artist who became my friend And she gave me watercolor lessons after my work day. I just would go over to her house. And so I I just picked up right where my grandfather had left off, but with like a, a, you know, 30, 40 years. Yeah. So your art was always, always in your life, just um, kind of as an avocation or a wonderful hobby, a beloved hobby, as I like to call things, something that you really enjoyed doing. and. You know, I was thinking about that, um, you know, working with your grandfather the way, the way that you did. How wonderful to have that kind of a contact with your grandfather on a regular basis where somebody was paying attention to the work that you did and, and responding to, you know, what you, you sent to them. Because I can tell you as a grandparent, and maybe you're a grandparent too, we just struggle no. for ways to be involved in the kids' lives. And there your grandpa just did it. So, Yahoo! Oh, fantastic yeah, that is right. Yes, yeah, so I was so fortunate. And I am not a grandparent, but I'm yearning to be one, and that's exactly what <laughs> that's exactly what I would do with a grandchild. I would find. Oh, you well, know. you've given me a clue because I can tell you, there's absolutely nothing like it. Um, you know, to have a grandchild, it's it's you know, you have a chance to share all the wisdom that you've uh, spent your life acquiring and share it in a way that, um, you know, is not pedantic, but rather in a way that is open and, and loving and giving, and, you know, and both sides benefit from that. It's a fabulous relationship. Well, so I, hope I get, what, get to. <laughs> I'm sure you will. I'm sure. <laughs> so, so what led you to the Merrillhurst program then, after well, you that, quit your teaching? That's an interesting story, too. We lived in West Lynn, just a block away from Merrillhurst University. So every night after teaching, I would go for a walk on the campus. 
And one day I came upon the art therapy building just uh, during my walk and became interested. And I started reading all the different flyers on the building and watching students come in and out and became very curious because I'd never heard of art therapy before. And I knew that I, at that time I was burned out on teaching and that I wanted to do something else. So I started at, you know, um, contacting the university, asking for materials, and before long I had an interview, and, you know, they had hooked me by, by then. <laughs> and, <laughs> so I started with just one class, you know, in the evenings, and then I finally said, you know, this is what I'm really interested in, and eventually I entered the program and, you know, quit my teaching job. No, you know, so many of my guests tell stories just like you're telling of, you know, little um, instances where there's tremendous serendipity and the right thing shows up at exactly the right moment and, you know, you're ready and here it comes and, you know, they, they follow that uh, lead, whatever it is, and, you know, that bit of curiosity and it turns into something grand in their lives. So oh, I, I love that story. You're standing there reading the flyer, and the next thing you know, you're enrolled in the program. <laughs> yes, and maybe that's, that's the difference between us and people who don't leave their jobs. They may uh -huh. have these serendipitous moments, but they don't follow them. And so I just, I did, and that's what made all the difference. Wow. So you got a degree in art therapy. What, what, tell me about art therapy. What, what does an art therapist do? What, what is this? Okay, well, art therapy is a very new and very small profession. It's much like music therapy. It's not something most people know about. And it was, um, it was begun right after World War II by an English woman named Margaret Nomberg, uh, who was seeing veterans who needed, needed help, and she started trying to use art and develop this whole field. So what art therapists do is they work with people who need mental or physical healing in settings like residential treatment, drug and alcohol counseling, hospitals, places like that. And they do both individual and group counseling, integrating art into their counseling. So it's kind of um, it's a combination of clinical psychology and artwork. It's, it's really hmm coming from both fields. So in the Merrill Hurst program, there, is, there are years of clinical psychology embedded in the program. It's actually very, very clinical. And the art is sort of secondary. But so, uh, there are programs throughout the country now, and they do different combinations of the two. So some of them are more art-based and less clinical, but the Merrill Hurst program is very clinical. So, so it, you know, give me a picture of that. So your, the classes that you took were heavily, uh, about, you know, sent towards clinical psychology, but then would you talk about what kind of, say, an art exercise or an art assignment might help somebody bring out an idea, or would it be teaching you how to read the art that somebody produced to understand what was going on for them? I mean, how does that work? This is the challenge trying to <laughs> trying to explain <laughs> how it works because yeah. it's a little it's a little bit mysterious how and why. I mean, there there's a lot of research on art therapy and it's documented, but there's a magical thing that happens that's hard to explain. Um, I did a group in Nicaragua this last winter, and I taught professionals how to use art therapy with elderly clients in assisted care. Mm -hmm so that they have something to do. And here is an example of um, a lesson or an art therapy project. Mm -hmm. I made these blank circles, uh, large circles with Sharpie pen, and then did different designs inside. They're called mandalas. And mandala mm -hmm. is a symbol of healing because it's circular and makes the, the artist feel secure. So just coloring inside the circle, whatever is the design, can be very soothing if they keep at it. So that's all I did for mm -hmm. an hour, and these people mm -hmm. were transfixed. They did So you, you laid the pattern out, the mandala pattern out on the mm -hmm. circle, and they colored it? Well, here's oh, part wow. of the deal. Here's part of the deal. There has to be choice by the uh -huh. the the patient or artist, mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. choose the mandala design that they like. It's always got to be personally meaningful to them 
If they don't mm-hmm. like the design, it's not going to be very therapeutic. So they choose the one they like, and then they can color it in any way they want. And throughout that process, they are soothed. Sometimes they'll start talking. They haven't been talking for a long time. Um, it's a little bit hard to describe, but it was a highly yeah. successful lesson. And every single one of them participated. Even men who didn't want to do art eventually joined in. And um, that's a, just one example of an art therapy exercise. And it works for almost everyone, I've found. Well, that's fantastic. That is really fantastic. So it sounds like you're having great adventures with this. Um, if you're going to Nicaragua to teach, that that doesn't sound so bad to me as a second <laughs> it wasn't career. Not bad at all. <laughs> the weather was the weather was perfect every day, so that didn't hurt. Yeah, yeah. So are you doing more of that? Are you are you traveling with your art therapy? You know, I'm hoping and, too. This is again one of those serendipitous connections. I didn't look for it; it just came to me. Um, Mm -hmm. through a connection by my husband who's on a board at Clackamas Community College. And there's a woman who runs these programs, and she just one day talked to him about it. He told her I was an art therapist. She called me up. She said, we'd like you to come and and, uh, share this with our assisted care professionals because there are no art therapists in Nicaragua. So I basically introduced it. (laughs) And... um, if if I if he hadn't known her, this wouldn't have happened. But it, I, again, it was serendipity. I said yes to something I knew nothing about, and it was it yes. was a wonderful experience. Yes, yes. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Good for you. And it's so it's interesting to hear how uh, art can be used that way. So, you know, what you're giving people, as you say, is choice to express themselves, and they they're getting involved in that expression. And that is what maybe calms inner turmoil or helps people bring to the surface things that they're maybe not consciously thinking but are subconsciously stopping them or getting in their way or nattering at them or, you know, and here's some way to bring that out and, you know, get it on paper. Do I have it? it, Yes, you have it. You hit the nail on the head. What makes art therapy unique as, as a therapy is that it does tap right into the subconscious. Whereas Uh some kind of an art project, like making Valentine's on Valentine's Day, will not do that. But if it's art that's chosen by the person and is meaningful, then it it taps into the subconscious. That's what makes it such a a valuable tool. Hmm. So then your job as the teacher is probably to set up the exercise, make the the tools and the, you know, available, you know, the paint or whatever it is available and the, you know, the canvas, you know, even though this time it was circles available to people and then, you know, watch what's happening and be there to catch anything that might come up that is very painful to them and maybe cause an emotional reaction. Is that what you would do? That, that's very, that's a very good analysis of what, what we do, yes. And uh-huh. you carefully uh-huh. set up each project to fit your clients. Um, you know, if they are very, very uh, disturbed by PTSD, you don't want any kind of art that would take them there. You want very simple, very concrete art like colored pencils or uh, something like that, something that is not going to tap into the, into their wounds. So a trained yeah. art therapist knows how to do that. That's why it's so valuable also in teaching because I know what my students are, you know, what they, what they can handle, what they can't handle. And so um, most likely their lessons will be a success. Hmm. So you, you got your degree and your master's in art therapy, and then you started working with kids. So talk about that. Uh, what do you, what, how do you work with kids with art therapy? Well, that was just a very easy combination for me because I have all these years of teaching and then my passion right. just happens to be art. So it came together very easily when I didn't get a job in art therapy and I was at a neighborhood block party one day here in northeast Portland talking lots of, to lots of parents, told them I was a teacher and I'd like to teach art and several people were interested. They had kids school age and they said, well, would you consider you know, teaching right? in your studio because I had just set up a studio and I said sure so it kind of just happened again and so I started doing that and then it was 
mother to mother word of mouth after that. I never once have advertised. I've never, uh, you know, done passed out flyers or anything. It's just the mothers call each other. And I now have more students than I know what to do with because I only want to wow. be part time, but they're calling me. And <laughs> so yeah. it, it just grew naturally. And I think part of it is, you know, the lack of art in Portland schools in the last few years. They're really hungry for really good art instruction for their kids. Oh, yes. So you're you're basically teaching them, like, the basics of color, how to draw, you know, perspective, you know, different tools. Is that what they're learning? Yes. And right now, my group that I have, we're doing hand building with clay. So, Mm. um, you know, I, I carefully set up the lesson so it's not going to, you know, be too emotional or anything. They always choose the kind of creations they want to make, and then once they're happy with it, they're fired in a kiln, they paint them, they have a permanent, you know, piece of artwork. But, you know, it changes every time I teach. This summer I'll be doing a summer camp where kids will do what you talked about, color mixing, painting, mixed media, that kind of thing, a little little more casual type art. But I try to always make it personally meaningful to them so art therapy can happen if that's what they mm-hmm. need. Yeah, yeah. So do you, do you have a conversation with the kids and say, talk about this piece, what is it, and what does it mean to you, and, you know, what are you representing? I mean, do you ask them to talk about yeah. their, their art? Well, I, I kind of do. But I set it up so that it's a, a very low-stress environment. We never right. – um, we never allow negative comments, it's right. always positive, that kind of thing. And we talk about the process as we're doing it, as a, just like a running conversation. Boy, that was really difficult. I like how you uh, tried two or three things until you found something that worked. So I just kind of keep a conversation mm-hmm. going. And then mm-hmm. we have an actual sharing reflection time at the end of each lesson. And they hold out two fists. One fist is something hard about the lesson today, and one fist is something good. And they're very anxious to share that because they've all had some challenge and they want to talk about it and they all want to say what was fun or good. So every single lesson ends that way. And I've never Oh, that's very smart. Go yeah, ahead. I've never, it's quick, it's easy, but it, it causes them to reflect back on what they just went through and why it worked or it didn't work. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's very smart. So what age? What age are your students? Right now I'm doing like 6 to 12, but I have one uh-huh. teenager that I give, uh, who, who gets private lessons for me, which is more structured drawing, and she, I think she's about 14. So it's about 6 to 14 right now. Oh, that's fantastic. That is. And how long is each, each lesson? You know, it depends. With um, the teenager, I can go four or five hours if she wants it because, she, she, you know, her attention span will, will handle that. But with the little kids, right now I'm just doing two hours at a time. And then for summer mm-hmm. camp, we do four to five hours, but we have a break. We go to Grant Park for lunch. It's much more casual with lots of breaks. So I try to structure it for their age. Oh, that's wonderful. That's just absolutely wonderful. So do you, do you also um, work with adults? I do, actually. Um, uh, every month I volunteer at the Dougie Center for Grieving Children, and then I work with both children and adults who've lost a, a loved one. So we do groups, and I do individual art with kids, and it's pretty much as needed there. I do that every month. And then I also volunteer with Off the Couch Productions, which is a group for mentally handicapped adults. There are 40 of them who meet in a community center for socializing each month. So I uh, prepare an art lesson for them. This this will happen this summer. And uh, present it at the community center, and then I bring a whole group of art helpers, and we go in and help them complete the project. Oh, very good. Very good. It sounds like you have uh, reached well into the art community in Portland and uh, made your way. Oh, well, I'm you know, trying. you've got all kinds of contacts. <laughs> <laughs> I've been here a while, so that helps a lot. You know, yeah. I've, I've worked in the community and everything. So, yes, I'm lucky that way. I have lots of resources. Yes, and, and probably a lot of your old uh, uh, teaching resources, you know, that are happy to see you back in in teaching, even if you're in another 
subject right now and are going, ho ho, you know, Gay was such a wonderful teacher. I'm gonna, I want to tune in and see what she's doing with these art classes. What's happening for you? Yeah, I'd like to do more of that because I moved out of West Lynn and up to Portland, so I don't really see my fellow teachers much. Oh, but right. I would love right. to reach, you know, reach back out to them. Oh, yes, yes. And um, I like what you're doing. So how, you know, you said your students find you by word of mouth. Do you market at all? You know, I haven't done much marketing. Today is the biggest step I've ever made. (laughs) (laughs) I've been so lucky that these mothers just contact each other, and I I just sit back and wait for the phone to ring. But, you know, I Uh realized the other day these kids are going to grow up and become teenagers soon, and they're probably not going to want to come to uh, art with me as much. So I am going to have to start a little marketing eventually if uh, the word of mouth doesn't do it. Yeah, yeah, that may be. Um, and so do you Are you there? Yes. Okay, I gotcha. Do you have a website? No, I don't yet have a website. All I have is an email right now, and I'll, I will work on that, but um, it's not, not up yet. Yeah, yeah, because that's usually pretty basic, you know, when you're a solo, um, you know, you, you, pretty much everybody starts with a website to talk about what they do, and you might show some um, pictures of uh, pieces that your students have created. You might even put up a little video, you know, of one of your classes and what it's like and, you know, a, a page about you and your background. And, I mean, it would, it, I think it would really help you do that. And I know that uh, the people at Google tell us that 97% of people check your website before they buy from you. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. That's very yeah. interesting. Yeah. That's not shopping anymore. You know, it used to be we'd look in the yellow pages, but we don't do that anymore. Now we just go to the website and check you out. And, you know, they, they see your picture and they learn a little bit about your background and, you know, what kind of programs you're doing. And, and then they call you you know, to talk about what's up. So that's probably going to be a wonderful place for you to get started and um, think about doing that. I yeah, think that's would, probably, that would probably be my next step if I'm smart is is to work on that because this word of mouth will only last so long. <laughs> I can't yeah. rely on only that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I'm going to have, have to reduce, research that and figure out how to get into that. Yeah. and And there's lots of people that can – can help you and, um, you know, having your art background, you're going to want to have a lot to say about the design, I'm sure. But, you know, you can hire somebody to do the, help you with the technical part of it and then um, even have somebody help you polish the copy that goes on it, you know, because it's made up of pictures and words. And uh, I would bet you have wonderful pictures and, you know, you probably want, somebody to help you write the copy and make sure that it, um, you know, brings people to the site. But it's a pretty, it's a pretty wonderful thing. And as I say, that's how most people are shopping these days. The other wonderful thing about a, a website is it um, makes you global. You know, you're, you're then out there not just to your local neighborhood or even to your city, but you're out there for sure in the region. And you might be out there in, in broader places than that and build a community with other art therapists who are working with kids and, you know, um, are very interested in what you're doing and, you know, contact you and say, gosh, would you like to come teach in London? (laughs) (laughs) It makes things like that available to you, too, which would be pretty wonderful. Yeah. I I just need to figure out how to do that, and that would be a smart next step for me. Yeah, I I think it would. I think it would be a very wonderful next step for you to do that. And, um, you know, because it sounds like what you've done, Gay, is more than gotten your feet wet in this business of yours, and you're really beginning to make it work for you, and uh, taking some of the steps to, you know, solidify it would be a, a very good thing to do. And it moves it from being, this is just something casual that you do with, because the kids happen to show up, to something where, you know, you're saying, okay, I'm intentionally uh, building this business, and there's places I want to take it, there's messages I want to deliver, there's people that I want to meet, and actually maybe places that you want to go and teach like you did in Nicaragua. So 
you know, it, it, it's it's a, a route to do that, and I think you'd find it very helpful. So, so talk about yeah. So I, you know, I'm a business coach. I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> I probably need someone like you to help me right now. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I do that a lot. Yeah. I bet you do. So, yeah. So in your in your art classes that you do with the kids. Um, you told us a lot about how you structure them. So did they run for a certain period of time, like 10 weeks or three months or, you know, a month or, you know, something like that? Is is that how you've got that working? Well, how it's worked for me is it started in the neighborhood. So what I do yeah. is I structure them around the school year. So I do a fall session, which runs from, the you know, September to Christmas time. Then I do a winter you know, Sometimes I do a winter session, but being semi-retired, I always take off one season. So right now I do a fall session, a spring session, and then a summer camp. So Mm -hmm. the fall and spring sessions are two hours long after school. So the kids from my neighborhood walk right from the neighborhood school to my house. Oh, nice. Yeah, and then their parents walk because they're all in the neighborhood at you know right before dinner time and pick them up. So it's really convenient doing it that way. And then the summer camp is the same way. A lot of them walk to my house. They bring their lunch. We have lunch at noon, and then their parents pick them up afterwards. And those are more like four hours at a time, and I just do a week for the camp. So that's all, that's the way I've done it so far because I have to work around the, the school year and the school sessions. Sure. Oh, that's just absolutely fabulous. You know, in addition to your website, here I'm growing your business for you. You know, there's <laughs> some. Um, <laughs> I like well, that. You know, yeah, that's, this is what I do, by the way. Good. <laughs> uh, it's part of the Better, Smarter, Richer and Helping Solopreneurs. You know, the other thing, once we get your website up, see, now it's become we. <laughs> um, I like that. <laughs> once once you get the website up, there are a lot of e-tools for you to explore as well. You know, you um, might find ways to do some of your lessons um, uh, via video or webinar or teleseminar where uh, people could be working with you just like you worked with your grandpa. And mm-hmm. you could be teaching a class and people would tune into it on their computer and then they could take their art, their piece of art, and mail it to you or send it to you in some way, and you could critique it, or they could be even tuned into you on the computer and hold it up to you and talk to you, and you could talk about, you know, their choice of color and their choice of shape and things like that. I mean, the e-tools are so absolutely fantastic anymore that you're not limited to working in your neighborhood. And I suspect you have a very special gift with this and that if you um, wanted to reach out, you know, beyond your your northeast Portland neighborhood, that you would find welcome acceptance um, in many places and you could find the e-tools that would help you work with, um, you know, more remote groups, groups of people. I mean, it's happening all the time. Yeah. Um, I, you know, the, the e-tools are fabulous. Yeah, uh, that sounds like another good step for me to take next because when you were talking, I had this idea. Think of all the homeschooled kids out there whose mothers want them to get art but don't know how yes. to teach art. They can yes. then tune in to this e-tool, and I could be on there telling them how to do it, how to integrate art therapy if they want to do that, and then they could teach it to their homeschooled child. And I, there's probably a big market out there for that. I think there's a huge market for that. You know, I, I really do. And uh, I think people, as you've said before, are hungry for art. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things that uh, got dumped out of the school. So unceremoniously, you know, art and music left. Uh, and people are just absolutely hungry for it, to have that enrichment in their lives. And uh, I, I think it makes the uh, the STEM, you know, the science, technology, engineering, and math, it makes it bearable, okay? It's what is the softness that goes with it. And you say, well, why are we creating all these uh, structures and all this engineering and all this problem solving? It's so that we can have a life that is enriched with, you know, color and shape and form. I mean, you know, we have both left brain and right brain. And uh, 
to be whole people. And uh, I, I would think there would be great welcoming of um, your gifts with this to the learning community. So I hope I'm planting a little seed here. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, there are a couple of seeds that have been planted there. <laughs> but, you know, there's, you're talking about the value of art in learning, and there's lots of documentation behind that, what art can do for kids. If it's mm-hmm. part of their, you know, their schooling, um, it can help their motor skills, their language development, decision making, visual learning, inventiveness, cultural awareness. You know, overall, it's been shown to help raise grades overall because art does permeate all the subjects. Yes, it does. And you know, when you when you look around, um, my husband and I travel quite a bit, and we we wind up at the museums, and you know, I get thinking. Look at what gets saved, you know, out of all of what gets done. Look at what we treasure. You know, it's the art. You know, it's the pottery, it's the statues, it's the paintings, it's the, you know, the the shields, the drawings, the, you know, the jewelry. I mean, this is what we treasure, you know, that have, that has come down to the ages. We treasure what people have built and the art that they made. And, you know, we treasure it so much we, we put it in museums. You know, for us to look at because this is this is what you know is um, points out to be a society. So you're doing important work, Gay. Well, I hope so. I really do, and I think you know we have such short lives. What do we leave behind us when we go? You know, all dust to dust, our houses will be changed, our clothes will disappear, every trace of us will be gone. But if we leave artwork it lasts at least a generation or two. We leave something of ourselves behind that way to carry on. And that's why we love going to museums, to see what people have left behind, what what were their lives like, and we're curious. And, you know, I think if more people did art, they'd realize they they can leave a bit of themselves behind after they go. So I, I feel like you've answered this a lot, but I'll ask you the question anyway. So... What what do you find most satisfying about the work that you're doing now? Oh, I could talk for a long time on that one. <laughs> um, now, with what I'm doing now, I can teach exactly the way I want to, what I want to, when I want to, and I can do all of that without any bosses, report cards, boring staff meetings, um, all of the bureaucracy that goes into public school, I, I can just finally do it my way, and I can use what I've learned and, and I think is good for kids. Instead of having to meet a statewide curriculum, you know, I don't have to do standardized tests, and I used to have to do all those things. Plus, I get yes. to watch. Plus, I get to watch my students as they grow because I keep them usually for a couple years. And I watch them progress over time, which you can't do as much in grade school. You have them one year, and then they're gone. But I get to watch them develop a little bit and grow and learn to love art and, you know, become adults and all of that. Oh, that's wonderful. I mean, you're quite eloquent about it, and you made a great case for entrepreneurship. You know, I get to do what I want, when I want, how I want, you know, (laughs) without a bureaucracy. (laughs) But you have to realize also that it took me a long time to get here. I mean, you know, I'm I'm in the second half of my life, and and it's taken a while. So it would be nice if people didn't have to go through all that, if they could just jump right into it. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. I think that that there's a lot of value in that, in that growing learning process, um, you know, and that wisdom that is gained of spending the time exploring other routes and, you know, finding out this didn't work or something could work better. So, uh, yes, we want to allow people to get to being able to express themselves earlier, but, you know, there's value. There's value in all that time that you spent. Because I'll bet you're using every bit of it, you know, in how you're teaching the kids now. So when when you're working with kids in your art lessons, so how do you integrate your art therapy? Is that part of the um, reflection, you know, this, this yes. worked well, this didn't work well? Yes, and that's, that's a big part of it. And I think I talked earlier about how we have a discussion going during the art project. Um, mm-hmm. Because I always want to hear how they're doing. If something needs changing or doesn't need changing, 
Um, so it's kind of an ongoing discussion. And then the art therapy is just woven into it, the way I structure the lessons, like the mandala example is a good one. Mm -hmm. so I mm -hmm. structure the, act, the experience to be therapeutic for them by the, the choices of materials and subject matter and all of that. And then the, the real therapy, I think, comes at the end of the lesson when they reflect back and they share the hard thing and they share the good thing. And it, it starts to compute in their minds that, yes, I can do hard things now. Yes, I can get through them. And, yes, when it's over, I can see something good of it. So the idea is then for it to play out in their lives in other ways. And uh, it's it's the sharing time at the end where I'm hoping that connection is made. Oh boy, that's great. That's great. You know, I'm I'm thinking of a an NPR program that was on and it talked about how much better your kids are if you uh, teach them or you comment on trying. You know, on the effort mm -hmm. that they have made and appreciate the effort that they have made more than say saying to them all the time oh you're really smart because when you say you're really smart you know then they think well okay i don't have to try at this because i'm supposed to be smart and of course we all get our comeuppance in life that that isn't mm -hmm. enough but if you reward and recognize them for trying and making an effort then what you're doing is you're bringing to mind the idea that we it's okay to work at something. It's, you said it's okay for something to be hard, and you, you do it anyway, and you make something beautiful out of it, which is a huge life lesson. So mm -hmm. I can see that you're doing that. Cool. Yes, and, yeah. and another lesson is that it's also okay to fail. I mean, that's a part yes. of every, every successful person has dealt with failure in their life, and they will. They'll continue to. And that we talk about that too. Okay, this project didn't work out because it doesn't always work out. And why mm -hmm. is that? You know, and what can you do differently next time? And we process all those things. So there's so many lessons that can be made, you know, just around an art project. Yes. So how do you think art changes people? Well, I know that it changes people, and I, I'm, I've done some thinking about that. And it's mostly a personal thing. Um, meaningful art taps into the subconscious. So because of that, it allows a deeper, more reflective experience during the art making versus doing a handicraft, like I mentioned, Valentine's mm -hmm. and Valentine's mm -hmm. Day. You're probably not going to get art therapy out of that. It's not something you chose. It probably doesn't tap into any memories. But a meaningful art will do all that for you. Um, and I've experienced that change myself. Uh, when I once lost a teaching job, I wisely turned to painting, and I painted a self-portrait of myself in the forest moving through this path. And it took me several months, but by the end of the painting, I realized that I would be taking a new path, and it was okay. So that whole change happened to me. And that's about the time I got interested in art therapy and pursuing, you know, pursuing a degree and everything because of the change that had already happened to me. Oh, that's great. That's great. That's a, that's a wonderful story to tell. And I, I'm, I'm thinking about, as you were talking, I'm thinking about experiences I've had with people where you do a collage, you know, and you just it's not the the same as painting something but you know you cut out pictures and then put, tell, make the pictures tell a story of where you are in your life and how wonderful that is you know for making a picture of what you're looking for and where you want to go so i yeah, i, I don't yes it does so i don't have to worry about the answer to this question but i'd like you to talk about it anyway um I, my question is do you think we need more arts in the schools well, you probably know how I'm going to answer. <laughs> I do know how you're going to answer that <laughs> That's one. That's no surprise. <laughs> yes, of course I think we do. Um, yeah. I I was lucky enough to have art all the way through school, and my children were too. Um, they're already adults. But now I watch these kids in Portland, and um, thank goodness we have a Portland Arts Tax and parents who value art here. Because, uh, you know, to, to lose art is often a permanent thing. Once it's cut out of a budget, it, it might stay out and never come back. So, um, yes, and I do see that the arts tax is making differences. I hear 
my kids, I hear my students talk about the art lessons they're getting in school, and they're good ones. Their art's being integrated into their subjects along with science, and I see school artwork up in my local library. So I think we're on the road, but we've got to keep working to keep more art in the schools. Right. I was going to ask you about the Portland Arts Tax for those listeners who don't know. Um, Two years ago, the city of Portland passed a measure that uh, charges each earning person in a household so if you're earning any money, you're subject to this tax. It tra- charges $35 a year to each earning member of a household. And um, they've collected, uh, I don't know, I think like $7 million last year, and I'm not sure what they've collected this year. And the idea is for it to go to the school. So I, I, I hear you saying, Gay, that you are uh, getting the impact. You can see that it is going to the schools. It's not all going in administrative and bureaucratic costs, it's actually going into the schools and for um, actual art lessons and art teaching. Is that right? That is right. I'm starting to see it. Um, At first I wasn't sure, and then I started walking around a little more and looking in the libraries and, uh, you know, listening. And it looks like from what I can see, every elementary school now is getting at least one art teacher coming through. So that probably translates into one half day a week. But it's every week, and it's a good. It appears to be good quality art. Like I said, it's going to relate to if they're studying bugs, then they'll paint these different bugs, and it's all integrated so that you know the art is um, part of the whole school. And, and I think I'm hoping that we're on the road to more of that. But it's a good start. Oh, that's great. So that might be you know something else if you're looking to grow your business is to um, uh, get into that system as well. You know, <laughs> I, I can grow your business pretty big if you want to do that. <laughs> I know. <You> know <laughs> I'm not sure that's what I want. But. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. So um, we're, we're going to be shortly out of time. I know it's hard to believe. So do you have anything you'd like to add to the conversation we've had so far or any uh, ideas or advice you'd like to give our listeners? Anything that comes up? Well, I would just uh, encourage parents who value art to get lessons for their kids because um, they're they're getting a a tidbit at school. But I have kids who would love to do it every day, and now is the time Mm -hmm. to grow that seed so that they don't drop art when they become adults. I'm sure you know adults as I do who say, oh, I can't draw a straight line. Or, oh, yeah. I have no artistic ability. And see, I don't believe that. All mm-hmm. it takes is one teacher making a negative comment, and some, some people turn off art for the rest of their lives. And that doesn't have to happen. Um, mm-hmm. With, you know, some good art teachers and some lessons, this seed can grow. And you can see how it's changed my life. I mean, that's pretty obvious now. <laughs> and it could change other people's lives as well. I think, you know, it's just such a valuable tool that I just encourage parents to look for art lessons, look for art experiences for your kids at during vacations, have them draw pictures of where they've been and maybe keep a little art journal and just try and, and keep art alive in their in their lives as they're growing up. Why well, it sounds to me like you are full of good ideas. And uh, I think that your students are very lucky to have you. So I know that I've got uh, listeners who are just kind of jumping up and down and in excitement from your conversation and with ideas of how they can work. So uh, would you like to tell our listeners how they can contact you? Yes. I, um, I have a phone number, and they can feel free to call me. My phone number is 503-593-7645. My name is Gay Mitchell, and I also have an email address, and my email address is my name, Gay Mitchell, all one word, at Comcast.net. And I'd be glad to respond to them with any questions or hook them up with art classes. If they're in a different part of the city, I do know lots of other art teachers I could refer them to, give them ideas, so I would welcome any any questions or or comments that people might want to make. Well, Gay, I've just thoroughly enjoyed our conversation today. It's been 
enlightening and inspiring and um, just uh, full of good ideas and thoughts. And uh, I can just tell you my ideas for my granddaughter just running through my head as we talk. Oh, good. <laughs> well, you can yeah, talk to me I, too. <laughs> I, I've just I've just thoroughly enjoyed talking with you and listeners. I'm uh, we're out of time. I know we can hardly believe that that's happening again. And I want to remind you that this is Jackie B. Peterson, and I am the author of Better, Smarter, Richer: Seven Business Principles for Solo, Creative, and Encore Entrepreneurs. Those of you who are working in one-person businesses. And I also want to tell you that what we know is that one-person businesses are distinctly different from the traditional businesses, and that's because traditional businesses encourage you to grow your business by hiring employees. And then the big shock is you find yourself using all your time to manage your employees and don't get to do the work that you love. And my view is you ought to build your business doing the work that you love. And that's what solopreneurship is all about. So I hope that you will take a look at the website and the book, Better, Smarter, Richer. You can join a study group. We have a next study group starting at uh, Portland Community College Small Business Development Center on the morning of June 3rd from 9 to 11 a.m. Let me know if you're interested. You can find me on the website and just say, oh, I'd love to join that study group. What we do is we read the book fill in the blanks, it's a fill in the blanks workbook, then come in the cohort and discuss, as I like to say, your challenges, your ahas, your insights, and your yeah buts. And we work through that so that we can build your business into the successful business that you're looking for in your solo enterprise. Also, you can download the free ebook outlining the seven principles. You can sign up for our free newsletter with little tips from me that come out about every other week. And you can join the conversation on the blog. We'd love to hear from you. So again, tune in to Solo Pro Radio next week. And I want to thank you all for being good listeners today in this wonderful conversation. Goodbye.